We're going to begin Unit 3 with a discussion about atoms and how we found our current model for the atom. Atoms have a nucleus surrounded by orbiting electrons. Within the nucleus are protons and neutrons. These protons and neutrons are held together by something called the strong nuclear force. The electrons orbit the nucleus because there's an electrostatic attraction between the positively charged protons and the negatively charged electrons. Here we're looking at oxygen, which is atom number eight on the periodic table. And what that eight tells me is there's eight protons in the nucleus. So for a neutral oxygen atom, there'd be eight protons in the nucleus and eight electrons orbiting the nucleus. Notice how you can only have two electrons in your first shell. That's our lowest energy state. And then when we move out to the outer shell, we can have six electrons for a total of eight electrons. The further away you get from the nucleus, the more electrons you can get. We call those states excited states. The state closest to the nucleus is a stable state, and that is our ground level. The periodic table lists all of our known elements. Here we can see the periodic table. Uh, the atomic number on the top left, that is how many protons are in the nucleus. The atomic weight is the average mass of all the protons and the neutrons in the naturally occurring isotopes. So the isotopes are things that have different number of neutrons than protons. So all the naturally occurring isotopes, if you add them all up and average it out, that's how you get that atomic weight. There are man-made isotopes as well, so we don't include those in our atomic weight on the periodic table. The atomic structure was actually discovered by the ancient Greeks. It wasn't discovered, but just hypothesized. So they had a debate whether it was indivisible particles or if they were infinitely divisible. So what that means is infinitely divisible means if you could, could if you had a piece of gold and you had an infinitely sharp razor and you could continue to cut the gold forever and ever and ever would every single slice be gold and then indivisible particles say once you start slicing at a certain point it's no longer gold so today we know that if you slice the nucleus in half what we call nuclear fission that you have different particles and your original particle now changes John Dalton was the first person to come along with the atomic theory. And the reason he had the atomic theory was because things reacted together. Like if you take sodium and chlorine, Na and Cl, and you mix them together, what they're going to end up doing is forming into NaCl table salt. So he said there's got to be something in there creating an electric charge to bring these two things together. He didn't know it was an electric charge. But he just said these two things are sticking together like magnets. There must be something working around in there. J.J. Thompson in the late 1800s was the first person to discover the electron. So this is really only 130, 140 years old, this idea of the electron. And he discovered it using a cathode ray tube. And a cathode ray tube sends a beam of electrons from a positive side to a negative side through a vacuum. And it looks like a light beam. But when J.J. moved a magnet near the cathode ray tube, he saw that the beam deflected. And you can see that in our GIF here. When you move the magnet, its magnetic field interacts with the electrons, causing them to deflect or repel away. And J.J. knew that light wouldn't do that. So he had discovered something brand new, and he called this the electron. He knew that the electrons were negative, and later we determined that the electron were a fundamental particle of matter. These cathode ray tubes, CRTs, they're commonly referred to, were used in older televisions and older computer screens. We've replaced them in the last 10 or 15 years with plasma, first plasma, now LCD, and in the future there will probably be something better, but cathode ray tubes were the first type of television that we used. Now we had the electron, we knew the electron's charge, and Robert Millikan came along in 1906 to figure out the electron's mass. So he used some charged particles, he looked how the electrons were attracted up and down, he knew the rate of gravitational acceleration, and from this he could figure out the mass of an electron. So with Millikan and Thompson, we now have an electron's mass. 
So now we know there's an electron, this negatively charged particle. But an atom itself is neutrally charged. So if you have a negative and something's neutrally charged, there must be a positive that cancels it out. So and Thompson came up with this plum pudding model. So as he looked at his experiment with Millikan and he was thinking about it, he said, well, there must be something positive and the electrons we know are individual particles. So the atom itself is like a custard and the electrons are like raisins in a custard, which is what plum pudding is. And they float around in there and they cancel each other out. Look at our picture on the right. So you'd have these negative electrons floating around in a pool of custardy positive charge. Sort of like a chocolate chip cookie or chocolate chip ice cream would be another mental picture. This is the idea of how he thought that the atom worked. Then came along Ernest Rutherford. And Ernest Rutherford was the first person to discover a nucleus. And he did this through the gold foil experiment. Gold foil is very malleable. So when you take gold foil, you can roll it into a very, very thin sheet. And what Ernest Rutherford did is he sent helium particles or alpha particles into this gold foil. Now gold, if we go back to the periodic table real quick, you can see gold on our periodic table is right here, 79. So that tells me the atomic number is 79. The atomic weight is almost 200. Helium has an atomic weight of four. So in Rutherford's gold foil experiment, he shot particles, these helium particles, with a weight of four into gold with a weight of 200. So the gold was 50 times heavier than the helium. And what happened was the helium passed directly through the gold 99% of the time. Sometimes it would bounce backwards. So just imagine Rutherford, and to put it on a scale that we can comprehend a little better. Let's take me, I weigh about 200 pounds, and a school bus, which weighs probably about 50 times more than me, maybe 10,000 pounds. So 99 times out of 100, if I run full speed into the school bus, according to Rutherford's experiment, I pass directly through the school bus. Now, if you were watching this experiment and you saw me run directly through the school bus 99 times out of 100 and just one time bounce backwards, you would be mind blown. You wouldn't know what was going on. So this is how Rutherford felt. And what he determined is that all of the mass, or the majority of the mass of the atom is located in the nucleus. The nucleus is a concentrated mass surrounded by a cloud of electrons, which are very small. So in respect to the helium particle, an electron is like a fly. So if I'm running the school bus, and, it's, and most of the school bus is made up of flies, and there's just one really dense spot in the middle. If I get to the flies, I'm just going to run right through them. They're not going to even stop me at all. They're not going to slow me down. But when I hit that dense nucleus, I am going to be bounced off of it. And this is how Rutherford determined or found that we have a nucleus at the center of our atoms. We went from this discovery to determine that the nucleus was the positive part, the electrons were the negative part, and that's why our atoms have no charge. We talked briefly in the beginning about atomic number. Atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus. A neutral atom has the same number of protons as it does electrons. And it has the same number of protons as it does neutrons. So an atom has the same number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. An isotope has a different number of neutrons than protons. We usually refer to isotopes or think about isotopes as being radioactive, but not all isotopes are radioactive. Only really, only certain isotopes at the end of the spectrum um, that have a big difference in number are radioactive. Most isotopes are very harmless. Looking here, we see hydrogen 1, hydrogen 2, hydrogen 3. Hydrogen 2 would have one proton, one neutron, an atomic number of 1, and an atomic mass of 2. Hydrogen 1 has one hydrogen and an atomic mass of 1, which means it has no neutrons in it. And hydrogen 3 has one proton and two nucleus and two neutrons, which gives it an atomic mass of 3. 
The final theory we're going to look at is Bohr's theory. Bohr came along after Rutherford, after the electron of Thomson, and after everyone and said, okay, what happens is the electron essentially orbits the nucleus. It's the nuclear model of the atom. Bohr came up with this idea, this nuclear model of the atom. So what happens is the electron can have only certain energy levels. So it can be in its ground state. <clears throat> it can be in its ground state, which we call the lower orbital, or in an excited state, the higher orbital. To get to a higher orbital, you have to give energy to the electron. So you put in through electricity or you do work on it or heat it up and you can get it to a higher state. It doesn't want to be in a higher state. It wants to be lazy. It wants to get to its ground state. So what happens is this electron gives off that energy. It lets it go. And the way that it gives off its energy is in the form of radiation. This is where electromagnetic waves come from. The colors we see, the light we see, ultraviolet, microwaves are all electrons moving from higher orbitals to lower orbitals. To sum it up, here's the history of the atomic theory. Ancient Greeks, was matter indivisible or divisible? Could we divide it or not? Dalton, atoms came along and said they are indivisible. Atoms are a set quantity. It has to have a certain number of protons, which he didn't know about at the time, but atoms cannot be divided forever. J.J. Thompson came up with the plum pudding where the electrons are floating around in a pool or a custard of positive charge. Ernest Rutherford discovered the nucleus in the nuclear model and then Bohr came along with the planetary model where the electrons orbit the nucleus like the planets orbit the sun.